which means um, I want to make a case for using a lot of shells if you do seasonality studies in shell maps. And it's based on my PhD, which I finished last year in York, on um, the Farisan Islands. The Farisan Islands are in the south of the Red Sea, they're here. Uh, they were part of a larger project to look at the uh, marine uh, or coastal activity on the southern Red Sea to look at it as a gateway out of Africa. And uh, my PhD was basically on looking at the seasonality of the shell mounds. So now here, so they're massive shell mounds. They're 30 meters in diameter, 5 meters high. There's 3,000 of them, so really anything that you do with them is going to be large scale. And I looked at the seasonality um, that is in the shells, so people ate shells. And at some point they ate them, the shells stopped growing, and then seen the seasonality of the, the, the recorded seasonality when that happened. And that tells us something about uh, human mobility and so on. So we did that. Um, the small modern study. Um, we look at the local environment, local environment, and how it um, is being recorded in the oxygen isotopes of the shell. Uh, the environment is pretty simple. It doesn't really rain, so the water chemistry is basically the same. Uh, the temperature change is pretty simple. It goes up in summer, goes down in winter. Um, and we used that to estimate the oxygen isotope ratio, we compared it with the yeah, actual oxygen isotope ratio, and it, it looks all right, it's not bad, but it's largely all right. So we used that to uh, apply to the archaeological shells. And we took shells from several layers uh, in the deposit, and we just distributed them on the scrap to see uh, when they died. And it's just a number of shells, so we used uh, about uh, 66 shells, not far, actually 66 shells. And um, as you can see, we've got year-round exploitation, so people were eating shells the whole time. Um, we can see that there's an increase in summer, so we don't really know what else they eat, because there's almost no um, plant preservation, so we can't really say if it is because of the lack of plant in summer when it gets more arid, but it benefits. Um, so this is basically my PhD here, yeah, this graph. This is what I found out. Um, but I'm more interested in something else I found, uh, which is how the shells plot if you assign them groups of their actual stratigraphic unit. So these shells, they're sequential data from shells, and they track the local environment. And I group them by the location in layer A. So we've got the base, we've got the middle, we've got the top. And you can see that they all down kind of as a group um, as the year goes on and as the layer grows. So I use that uh, to argue for constant habitations that can make this layer eight. So you have about six months of constant shell eating, shell exploitation which is something you usually don't get. Usually you just get this graph here and you have a rough idea what happened in average. But here we know, because of this stratigraphic grouping, that this is um, an exploitation episode. And this isn't new. Um, people have done this before. Um, this is work by Thomas and Andres um, uh, from the States, and they looked at the sheltering complex on Zapello Island. And they group shells kind of stratigraphically and seasonally. So they said, if we have a group of shells that are kind of in the same spot and they were eaten at the same time, then this is a feasting activity. Because um, Americans like these. And they compare that to layers where you have a lot of variation, a lot of shells from different seasons. Um, and they said, well, this must be kind of low activity, just random shell eating. Every day, nothing special. Uh, I made a graph to kind of show that, so each arrow is kind of a season. I don't know if that's easy to understand, but it's basically stratigraphic. But here you've got all the shells in one, here you've got all the shells doing something else, some other season. Feasting, small scale food supply. And if you compare that to what we find in Farisan, 
we've got the change throughout the layer in C lens, which I find really, really interesting because it allows us to ask uh, different questions to the deposit. The cool thing is that specifically it allows us to address accumulation rates um, on a seasonal level because we know that this is about six or seven months. We know when it started, we know when it ended. And this is say, very similar to accumulation rates as we know from radio carbon dates. So if you, if you know the um, publication Big Site Short Time by Stein, um, she looks at radio carbon dates from different parts within one layer, compares them, and then says, well, if this is much older than this, then, well, it fits. And this is kind of the time frame of when this accumulated. When the dates are kind of the same, then this accumulated really quickly. And then these accumulation rates allow you to make some really cool assumptions about changes in ecology, changes in population. And by applying not really carbon dates, but seasonality, we can ask the same question, but on a much, 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 much smaller time scale. We don't have a plus minus of 30 years, we have a plus minus of 30 days or two months, depending on the proxy you use for a seasonality. And yeah, it allows you to kind of address the same question but on a different scale. By kind of grouping, stratigraphically, stratigraphically grouping the shells like this, you get evidence for continuity, people were there the whole time, which is interesting for sites where you don't have habitational sites, you don't have anything but the shell marks. So this tells you a little bit more about human mobility. It gives you a measure for variability of the climatic proxy that you're using. Because we can assume that these shells all died in the same, in the same year, they must have been recording the same water temperature, the same water. This is not variability from one year to another. This is the same water, and they recorded it differently, which tells you how accurate your climatic proxy actually is. Um, I know the third thing is that all the questions that you have want to ask about depositional things in shells, uh, you can ask again by having a seasonal input. And I like to have burials and artifacts in our shell mounts, but we don't. So I can only say that potentially you can ask questions like, I refitted this core. I want to know like if this part of the like let's say you can't find a lake here, lake there, they're both on the same core. Is the difference in seasons the durability of the tool that you got out of it? Um, then there are ritual practices where some things are being buried before others. And here you get a signal kind of component, temporal component. But the cell sounds pretty really great. Um, who's going to analyze all those shells? This is like 100 shells. And I did 66 for my PhD. It took me long enough. Um, if you look at the sequential samples within one shell, it's like 10 samples per shell. And then for the whole mound, that's tens of thousands of euros. Like, don't include do that. It's, not, it's interesting, it's not that interesting. <laughs> and, Luckily, uh, some people at the University of Cantabria uh, are really smart cookies. So they, um, I don't just say that because I know that it might be some audience. I say that because well, I have some ladies. And they use the uh, laser ablation technique called laser induced fractal spectroscopy, which is a very rough and ready, very quick um, laser ablation technique, and apply that to archaeological shells. So it's very quick, it's also very cheap. And more importantly, you can automate it, which means that you don't have to do anything. And you can go and have a coffee and then come back in 10 shells later. And like half an hour. So this is really cool. Um, quick breakdown of what it says in the spectral spectroscopy. You take a laser, you shoot it through prisms and mirrors to get to your sample, you focus the light, you create plasma, uh, plasma explodes, emits light. The light is being collected, sent to a spectrograph, and it gives you a spectrum which looks like this, um, where you see the elemental composition of whatever you use at. Um, if you go to the tower, the sample looks like this. So this is the crater I made. 
have like 50 pulses or so, it's about uh, 100 microns wide. Um, usually it takes up the first 10 microns of the sample, so it's somewhat destructive, but not really. Um, I started a project on this uh, four months ago at the Institute of Electronic Structure and Laser in Crete, where I try to get archaeological and climatic data from all kinds of shells around the world to come up with a method to to automate it, make it easy for everyone to use. Um, so not everybody has to learn spectroscopy like I have to do now. And ideally go towards um, field application calculation can be mobile. So I start working. Um, these are the first results. I know the tiny set results, but they're just like preliminary results. Um, and naturally, I start with the same species again from Farsan. I know that species. I have uh, isotope measurements for it already, so I kind of know what's going on. And it looks fine. I get good variation. Um, I get nice plots, mental plots of small parts of the shell. But the species from the Marine Spatial Arctic turned out to be real bugger to analyze because. Um, it's not a nice high valve, and so it can change it. It's not linear, everything's kind of healing off. If you take a section through like it did here, um, you only get a few months because it grows so fast. And you have to end up, kind of end up taking measurements on the top and around here, to some holes here, to put it, the, the drilling for oxygen isotopes. And it's easy to drill it, but if you have to automate a laser, it's more difficult. So I got frustrated last week, and I used an oyster iron lying around, and got really nice results. Um, these have 72 measurements that I took within two minutes. And I get the data instantly. Um, there's almost no sample preparation, because it just, there's dust, you just ablate dust away, and then you start. Analyzing speculative. Uh Yeah, I've stopped there, so that's all I have for now. <laughs> um, but hopefully, in the next conference, I've got some more, some more um, shell species. I kind of have to do the Conomoro Spasiatus one from Parasan because it's written in the project, but it's really not. Uh, okay, I want to thank all these people in the <laughs>